Good evening. Please give me better than that. Good evening. There we go. I know it's it's the after dinner time and everyone's a little tired, so we gotta get get the juices going a little bit. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight, uh, and I really mean that. This is one of my favorite things I get to do every year is to come and talk with our Canadians and our candidates uh, to help you grow in your faith, to help you come to understand a little bit better the different aspects about the Catholic faith, uh, and to grow closer to one another and to our parish community. Uh, I've been a member of this parish for about four and a half years now. My family moved here. Uh, like Ryan said, I'm originally from Kansas City. Uh, and yes, lots of good food, lots of great barbecue. Uh, I'm going to miss not being there for Christmas this year because uh, every other year my two best friends and I are in Kansas City at the same, same time. Uh, and my best friend always takes us out to a nice dinner. Uh, he works for the federal government, makes a lot more than I ever will, and so I allow him to take us out to dinner and he gets to pay, uh, which is really nice, but we always enjoy some good barbecue. Uh, I did my undergraduate work in theology at Quincy University, which is a small Franciscan school in Illinois on the Mississippi. That's where I met my wonderful wife. We just celebrated 20 years of marriage uh, in September, uh, and back in June, we welcomed our ninth child. Boy number six, we got six boys, three girls. As you can imagine, it's a very loud and raucous house. Uh, it was just me and my sister growing up, and so one of the big big learnings for me as a father of such a large family is learning how boys play together, uh, or really, you know, fight and wrestle and call that playing together. Because uh, it was just me and my sister, I didn't have that kind of relationship, so I really had to kind of mellow out and not get so freaked out when my boys are, uh, are going at it with each other. My girls are little angels, they're perfect. Uh, my day job is I am the manager of catechesis for the diocese here. That means I have the pleasure of working for Bishop Doherty uh, and helping him help people like Ryan. So catechesis is the fancy church word we use for religious education. Uh, it's about teaching the faith, passing on the faith, and so I get to help lots of people across our diocese uh, like Ryan, different directors of religious education, directors of evangelization, and help them to learn how better to pass on the faith and teach the faith to adults, to teens, to youth, all across the spectrum. We cover uh, religious formation from womb to tomb, really. So uh, that's what I get to do in my day job, and I really do love it. I've been in diocesan work for uh, over 12 years now. Before I was here, I was with the Diocese of Springfield in Illinois uh, for a number of years. But uh, my wife's family is from Indiana, so we really had to get that close to the family here. So, so tonight, we're going to talk about the church. Uh, and I have to start by saying I'm a little put out at the fact that I only have an hour and a half <laughs> to talk about this subject. Uh, last year I spent six weeks. Uh, oh, I will give a break. I know. We'll get a break. Uh, last year I actually did six weeks with our deacon candidates in the diocese doing ecclesiology, which is the fancy church word for the study of the church. Uh, and so I'm trying to convince you, 12 hours worth into an hour and a half, a little bit of a challenge. We'll see how I do. Really just going to kind of hit the highlights. I figure my my task tonight is so not so much to teach you everything there is to know about the church, but to whet your appetite a little bit. You know, give you the highlights, give you the important things, and maybe a few little teasers about some interesting things in the church you might want to take a look at later. So the first question we have to ask is, what is the church? A good basic question to ask. The word church, what we say in English as church, comes from a Greek word. Ecclesia. That's where we get the Latin root for what we say in church in the Catholic Church, or uh, the fancy English word sometimes is ecclesial. If something is ecclesial, it means it has to do with the church. But in the Greek, the ecclesia comes from two words, ek and kaleo, which ek means out, and kaleo means to be called. So the ecclesia, the church, are those who are called out. Those who are called and go somewhere, as a people, not as a singular individual, but as a people. In the Greek city-states, the Ecclesia was a democratic assembly of citizens. It was kind of their way of making important decisions. So they would call an Ecclesia, all the citizens, which was only males back then, only males could be citizens, uh, would come together and they could do things like declare war against one of the other city-states, or they would elect officials together. But it was a gathering, it was a physical gathering of coming together for important business for the community. Now, when the biblical writers were writing, they adopted that same word, ecclesia, to talk about a couple of different things. In the Old Testament, 
That word ecclesia is used to talk about a gathering of the Israelites. So in the Old Testament, whenever the Israelites would gather together for important business, the biblical writer uses the word ecclesia in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. So, for instance, as the Israelites are journeying through the Exodus and they arrive at Mount Sinai, they make camp at the base of the mountain. Moses goes up to the mountain and comes back with the Ten Commandments. The word used for that gathering of the Israelites as Moses is coming down to give them the law is the ecclesia. It is the gathering of the Israelites to come to receive the law from Moses. In the New Testament, that word ecclesia is used to describe the faithful coming together. Those who have chosen to follow Jesus Christ coming together, especially for the act of worship. That gathering, that assembly is also called the ecclesia. So that's kind of the root of the word itself. That still doesn't really give us a, a clear definition of what is the church. One thing we could say is that the church is a mystery. Now mystery, when we talk about that in church language, it's a very specific word. It doesn't just mean something we have to figure out or something that's hidden. It's not like a murder mystery where you get to the end of the book and you'll have a clear answer of who done it. A mystery in the theological sense means a supernatural reality that has been revealed to us and that we can understand but never fully. We can never come to a full understanding of what a theological mystery is. We can continue to wrestle with it and unravel it and there will always be more there to learn. Always be more there to accept. Uh, a good way to think about it is like, it's like a bottomless pit. You can never plumb the depths of a mystery. And in the Christian faith, we have lots of mysteries. We talk about the mystery of the Trinity, or the mystery of the Incarnation, or the Paschal mystery, the life, death, suffering, uh, life, suffering, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. Those are all mysteries. We can never plumb their depths. The church, too, is a mystery. We can spend a lifetime studying about the church, thinking about the church, praying about the church, and we're never going to come to a full understanding about what the church is. That doesn't mean we don't have any understanding. It doesn't mean it's unknown. It just means that our understanding continues to unfold over time. So keep that in mind throughout the rest of the night. That everything I'm presenting to you today is an understanding, but it can never be the fullness of our understanding of the church. It is a mystery. All right, so that still doesn't get us to a real clear definition, does it? For that, we're going to turn to a document called Dominus Jesus, which was produced by the church in the year 2000, to give us some specific guidance about what is and is not a church. And the answer they came up to was surprisingly simple about what it is that actually constitutes a church. In Dominus Jesus, they taught, in order to be a true church, you have to have two things. You have to have valid apostolic succession and a valid Eucharist. If your gathering of Christians, if your ecclesia, can have those two things, you are a church. Now, what do those two things mean? First of all, apostolic succession. That's another fancy church word. It means that we have bishops who can trace themselves back to the original apostles. We read in the Acts of Apostles, after Jesus has ascended into heaven, that the 11 gathered back together, what was originally 12 was now 11, and they chose a successor. If you remember, after uh, he betrayed Jesus to the authorities, Judas commits suicide, which is why there's now only 11 apostles. And the 11 decide, we can't just be 11. One of the reasons Jesus chose 12 apostles was to mirror the 12 tribes of Israel. And so we can't have the tribes be incomplete. So the apostles gather together and say, we need someone else. We need someone to succeed Judas to complete our numbers again. And so they wind up choosing Matthias in order to complete their numbers again back to 12. Well, as the apostles went out on their missionary journeys and set up churches all across the ancient world in different cities, they appointed leaders over the Christian communities that they founded. And those leaders were the first bishops. They were successors to the apostles. The apostles couldn't be everywhere. So as they went around, they appointed others to be bishops over the communities that they founded. Those bishops later then appointed other bishops. And so on down the line. 
So in theory, every bishop in the Catholic Church can trace themselves back from the bishop who ordained them to the bishop who ordained that bishop to the bishop who ordained that bishop all the way back to the original 12 apostles. There's, I think there's some websites actually that try to do that. I'm not sure how far back you can actually get in terms of how good our records are, but you can get pretty far back. You know, if you trace it all back. The idea is this apostolic succession, the authority of the apostles, has been passed down through the centuries to the current bishops. That's what we call apostolic succession. So in order to have a valid church, you have to have valid apostolic succession in your leadership. You also have to have a valid Eucharist. So you have to have some means of validly uh, consecrating the bled, bread and wine to become the body and blood of Jesus Christ, which means you have to have a valid priesthood. That's kind of a corollary to that one. So apostolic succession, priesthood, Eucharist. If you have those things, you are considered by the Catholic Church to be an authentic, true Christian church with a big capital C church. If not, you are what the church would call an ecclesial community. It means you lack one or the other of those or don't have the fullness of it in some way. It doesn't mean they're not Christian. And this is the important point I want to make. Just because you are not a member of a valid church does not mean you are Christian. And the document makes that point very clear by saying the baptisms are still valid. And that's the important thing that makes you a Christian, is to be baptized. If you are baptized, you are by definition a Christian. And so we accept the baptism of some of these communities, but we don't accept a lot of their other sacraments. Or we don't accept that their leaders have valid apostolic succession. So that means that the Catholic Church, church with a big C, is not the only church with a big C. The big other one would be the Eastern Orthodox churches. The Catholic Church acknowledges they have valid apostolic succession, they have a valid Eucharist. What they don't have is communion with the Bishop of Rome. So the Eastern Orthodox churches are what we would call in schism, which just means separated. It means they're a valid church, they're just separated from the Bishop of Rome. Our hope is that one day we'll reunite. We'll actually talk about that in just a little bit. So these ecclesial communities then are what we would traditionally think of as the Protestant churches. So Baptists, Methodists, uh, you know, those kinds of Protestant churches. Properly speaking, the Catholic Church calls them ecclesial communities. Again, we acknowledge their baptism, but they are not, they don't have the fullness of what it means to be a church. And they, uh, obviously they don't have communion with the, the Bishop of Rome, the Pope. Uh, but they have the valid baptism and have, in some sense, an imperfect communion with the Catholic Church because they have the faith, they have baptism, they are still brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ with those of us who are Catholics. But that communion is imperfect. They don't have the fullness of the Catholic faith, they don't have the fullness of what it means to be a church. Again, our hope is that one day, all Christians will be brought together in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church again, together as one. That is, that is our prayer. It's the prayer that Jesus gave to the apostles at the Last Supper in the Gospel of John. He prayed to the Father that they may be one as he and the Father are one. You know, we pray for Christian unity, even as we recognize it's not currently a reality. So by a very basic definition, this is what it means to be a church. Having valid apostolic succession, having a valid Eucharist. If you have those two things, you are a church with a big C. But that's not the only way we think about the church. In the 1960s, all the bishops of the world gathered together for what's called an ecumenical council, which again is just a fancy church word for a gathering of all the bishops of the world. They came to Rome, they took four years, they met in spurts over four years, to discuss how they needed to teach the Catholic faith today. And one of the first documents that they produced out of that council was a document called Lumen Gentium, the Dogmatic Constitution on the Church. In other words, it's a teaching document about the nature of the Church. Uh, it's a little long, it gets a little technical in places, but it's really a beautiful document, a beautiful reflection on how we understand ourselves as Church. And I apologize, I'm going to quote it kind of at length here, one section of it. 
uh, because I think it, it has some very important points for us to reflect on tonight. So this is back in the 1960s, the bishops together talked. Christ, the one mediator, established and continually sustains here on earth his holy church, the community of faith, hope, and charity, as an entity with visible delineation through which he communicated truth and grace to all. So let's stop there for just a second. The important thing here is this holy church is an entity with visible delineation. That means we can see here on earth what the church is. It, just, it isn't some kind of invisible communion, but we, we can see the church gathered together. The Second Vatican Council was itself an example of the visible delineation of the church. All the bishops of the world gathering together in Rome is the church present there in Rome. Those bishops together. When we gather together on Sunday in the church right over here, that is a visible delineation of the church. This local community gathered together in communion with one another in order to worship the Lord and receive the Eucharist. So visible delineation, you have to be able to see the church. It has to have a visible structure here on earth. But the society structured with hierarchical organs and the mystical body of Christ are not to be considered as two realities, nor are the visible assembly in the spiritual community nor the earthly church and the church in which with heavenly things. Rather, they form one complex reality which coalesces from a divine and human element. In other words, that visible reality that we can see here is part of that mystical spiritual church that transcends time and space, that includes the saints in heaven, that includes our forefathers in the faith, that we are still in communion with, even though we don't see them here present with us on earth. You can't separate that visible, institutional, earthly organization from the mystical, spiritual body of Christ. They are one and the same. They're like two sides of the same coin. So the earth isn't just an, uh, the church isn't just an earthly organization, but has a spiritual reality that undergirds it, that supports it and sustains it. The bishops go on. This is the one church of Christ, which in the creed is professed as one holy Catholic and apostolic, which our Savior, after his resurrection, commissioned Peter the shepherd and him and the other apostles to extend and direct authority which he erected for all ages as the pillar and mainstay of the truth. So in other words, Jesus instituted the church as part of his earthly ministry. While Jesus was here on earth, he instituted the church. He invested it with authority. He gave to the apostles the ability to forgive sins. He gave to Peter a special authority over and above the other apostles, to be the shepherd of the people. He ordained them as priests in order to give us the Eucharist. You know, Jesus did all these things in his ministry here on earth before his death and resurrection and ascension. So it has its roots in Jesus himself. And then finally, this church constituted and organized in the world as a society subsists in the Catholic Church which is governed by the successor of Peter and by the bishops in communion with them, although many elements of sanctification and of truth are found outside of its visible structure. These elements, as gifts belonging to the Church of Christ, are forces compelling toward Catholic unity. That word subsists up there is a very interesting word theologically. The bishops debated for a long time over how to describe the relationship between that mystical body of Christ and the Catholic Church on earth. Did they want to say that that, that, that mystical church was the Catholic Church? That there's a one-to-one -one relation? A lot of bishops advocated for that. What they said instead is that that Holy Church subsists in the Catholic Church. In other words, the fullness of it resides in the Catholic Church, but we don't have a monopoly on it. The fullness of that mystical body of Christ resides in us, 
but it can also be found elsewhere. That's again why we say of our Protestant brothers and sisters, they are truly our brothers and sisters in Christ. Even as we say they do not have the fullness of the faith, they don't have the fullness of the truth. Even as we say they may not have the fullness of what it means to be a church, there are still, as the Council said, elements of sanctification and of truth found in those communities. You can find a relationship with Jesus Christ as a Baptist. You can find a relationship with Jesus Christ as a Pentecostal. Christ can be found there. Christ isn't bound by us. Christ can reach out to anyone however he wants. You know, we can't control it. That's not our job. Our job is to respond when Jesus reaches out to us. But Jesus can do that any way he wants, in any place he wants. And the Council Fathers recognize that which is why they chose that word subsist, as a recognition that the Catholic Church has that fullness, but we don't control it. It's a gift from God to us, but it's God's gift to give. And so we recognize that there are elements of sanctification, of holiness, and of truth in other Christian communities. And we give thanks for that. It's part of what unites us as Christians with those. We give thanks for that. But we believe that the fullness of it subsists in the Catholic Church, which is why we remain here. And again, as it says at the end, these elements are forces compelling toward a Catholic unity. In other words, we hope that, that the fact that these gifts are out there shared by everyone will help us one day to come together as one church. You know, that's what we call the work of ecumenism. You know, the work of reaching out to our other Christian brothers and sisters in the hopes that one day we can overcome our differences and achieve the unity that the early church had uh, and truly be one holy Catholic apostolic church. Any questions about any of these definitions? I know they're a little technical. <laughs> the church never does anything simply. All right, we will go on then. So these are kind of the formal definitions of the church, but it's not the only way the church thinks about herself. You know, we're not all about formal definitions. The church also uses a lot of different metaphors and what we might call models of the church as ways to think about the church. So when you came in, you should have gotten a copy of this handout. Uh, this section will kind of be going through this handout just a bit. This is based on the work uh, of one of the great theologians of the 20th century. Cardinal Avery Dulles. He was a Jesuit theologian, American. Uh, if you've ever flown into Washington, D.C., Dulles International Airport is named after his father. His father was, uh, I believe, a senator, a very important senator uh, in the mid-century. Uh, but Cardinal Dulles chose to become a Jesuit and became one of the most renowned theologians, uh, especially in the late 20th century, to the point where he was actually made a cardinal, uh, even though he wasn't a bishop. Uh, he was made a cardinal by uh, St. John Paul II in recognition of his great contribution to the thinking of the church. And one of those contributions was a book entitled Models of the Church, in which he set out to kind of examine some of the different ways over the centuries the church has thought about herself. Now, the important thing to note from the outset here is, and Cardinal Dulles was very clear about this in his book, no single one of these models is the model. You cannot select any one of these models as the correct model. Because again, the church is a mystery. We can't plumb its depths. We can't say that, that this, this way of looking at the church encompasses everything there is to know about the church. Rather, its purpose was to propose a number of models to give us a more holistic picture of what the church is to give us a more well-rounded understanding about what the church is. And in the book, he, he goes to pains to point out that every model has its strengths, but also has its weaknesses. So that if you only operate out of one model, you're going to have some weaknesses to the way that you operate as church. So these are the ones he proposes. First of all is the church as an institution. And this may be the simplest of the models that he gives us. Just understanding the church as an organization. 
This, in many ways, was the dominant model from the Protestant Reformation up until the mid-20th century. You know, after the church uh, experienced the great schism of the Protestant Reformation, she started really kind of hunkering down and proposing, you know, set definitions and trying to, you know, making delineations about who was in and who was out. It became a very institutional way of thinking about the church, which is an understandable reaction. You know, when you have the great fracturing of Christianity that was the Protestant Reformation, you know, the church started to kind of think a little more hunger down. You know, it had to determine, all right, who is theologically in and who is theologically out. So it defines the church in light of visible structures. Are you Catholic or not? Well, are you enrolled in a parish? Have you been baptized? Do you have all the proper paperwork filled out? All that kind of stuff. You know, it focuses on what rights and responsibilities the church has. What powers does the church have given from God? And focuses on the validity of things like the sacraments, but not always on the efficacy. In other words, the institutional model of the church asks, do I have the right or the authority to do something, but not necessarily, is this actually a productive thing to do? You know, so in terms of, uh, what's a good example here? Uh, baptism, let's say. You know, it asks, did we use the right formula? Did we use the right kind of water? It asks those kinds of questions, but it doesn't ask, is this person growing in the faith? You know, because that's much harder to check a box on. <laughs> you know, the institutional model wants to check the boxes. So some of its assets are, it's, a, it's very clearly endorsed by some of the pre-conciliar, that's pre-1960, documents and teachings, because again, they're very focused on that institution. It has a very concrete historical link from the past to the present. You know, that idea of apostolic succession is a very institutional way of thinking. Can you trace your succession all the way back? It has a very strong sense of corporate identity among believers. You know, I know who is a member, and we know each other. On the other hand, there's very little basis for the church as an institution in sacred scripture. Jesus instituted the church, but he didn't tell us a whole lot about how the church was to be organized, how the church was supposed to structure itself. You know, Jesus didn't talk about dioceses. Jesus didn't talk about parishes. <laughs> you know, so there's very little in Scripture for the institutional understanding. Uh, it tends to focus on institutional virtues, and so it contends towards juridicism, which means focusing on the law and the rules. It can tend towards clericalism, and it can tend towards the triumphalism. We're so much better because we're members of the Catholic Church. You know, that kind of thinking. And in many ways, this model is out of phase with our modern times. You know, something we've been dealing with since, well, at least the 1970s, is a deep distrust of institutions in America. We don't invest a whole lot of trust and authority in institutions anymore. So presenting a very institutional face of the church can be off-putting for, for people who aren't members of the church. So we need to be careful with that. So institutional model has its strengths, has its weaknesses. The second model that Cardinal Bellis proposed was the mystical communion. And he gives kind of two examples of what that mystical communion can look like, both of which are drawn from Scripture. The first is St. Paul's teaching on the church as the body of Christ. You know, this is a very communal kind of organic image of what the church is. You know, we're all connected as different parts of a body. It includes visible and invisible elements. But he also said that the mystical communion can be summed up by an Old Testament image of the people of God. In the Old Testament, the Israelites are often referred to as God's own people as the people of God. So this kind of metaphor is rooted in a very covenantal understanding of the people. In the Old Testament, the Israelites are the people of God because God has established his covenant with them. God has made promises to the people. So you've, if you've accepted those promises and made promises to God in return, you are then a member of the people of God, or that is called communion. It sees the church more as a community of individuals and can become kind of monopolistic and egotistic if it's equated with the institution. 
you know, we are the people, we're the in people, they're all the out people, that kind of thinking. So the mystical communion has a much better basis in sacred scripture, has a deep foundation in the church teaching, especially some of the early church fathers, has a strong focus on the individual's relationship with God. There's also room for the Holy Spirit to work within this model. That's one of the downfalls sometimes of the institutional model, is the institution becomes very wary of people doing weird things prompted by the Spirit. The mystical community is much more open to promptings of the Holy Spirit and speaks to the human longing for community. All of us want to belong. All of us want to belong to something, and that idea of a mystical communion speaks to that. On the other hand, it can obscure the relationship between the spiritual and visible dimensions of the church. It has a tendency to spiritualize what we mean by the church, because it neglects the institution, it neglects the visible elements. Sometimes it can lack an identity or a mission. It speaks to who's in the church, but it doesn't speak to what the church does. What is the church's mission? So that's another one of the abilities of that. The third one that Dulles proposes is the church is a sacrament. And this really comes out of that Second Vatican Council in the 1960s. It was one of the first times that bishops started talking about the church as a sacrament. You know, a sacrament, you may recall, is a visible means of God's grace. So that doesn't mean that the church is one of the seven sacraments. It's more of a metaphor. It's talking about the church as a vehicle for God's grace coming into the world. So the sacramental model, as you might imagine, puts a primacy on the sacraments. It also tends to align the divine and visible elements of the church, because sacraments always involve a physical component to them, the water of baptism, the oil of confirmation, the bread and the wine. You know, so it sees the spiritual and the physical. It's very communally oriented because we come together for the sacraments. Views the church as a gift from God, but also recognizes that the church does not always act as a sign of God's grace. So it calls us to ongoing conversion. It calls us to continually be asking, how can I better follow Jesus Christ? How can I continue to grow in holiness? So it relates the institution to the mystical communion. In many ways, it kind of marries the best of the institution and the mystical communion models. It provides for the work of grace outside the institutional church. You know, it says that the institution doesn't have a stranglehold on God's grace, but it comes from many different places. And it can motivate loyalty and striving to maintain discipline while also making room for honest criticism. Because it, tell, it asks us to consider, how can I grow more in holiness? How am I currently engaged in activities that God doesn't want me to do? You know, sort of allows for that kind of self-criticism, that self-reflection. On the other hand, like the institution, there's not a lot of basis in sacred scripture or early church teaching for thinking about the church as a sacrament. Like I said, this really came out of the Second Vatican Council. It can sometimes focus on externals, more than that, the interior life. And it still lacks the service motivation of the church. That, that word diakonia means service. So it still doesn't have a strong sense of mission of the church and what the church can be doing in the world. And it can be really hard to preach this model. You know, it can be a little theological at times. On the other side, the fourth model is the church is herald. And this is a pretty simple model to understand. It's the church out in the world proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. So it puts a primacy on the word. You know, people who love sacred scripture love the church's herald model. It's very charismatic. It's oriented towards proclamation and preaching. It has a strong representation in Protestant ecclesiologies. A lot of Protestant communities operate out of the church's herald model. You know, the stereotypical preacher on the street corner on the soapbox. You know, that's classic church's herald. It also makes a sharp distinction between the church on earth and the kingdom of God. That when we're here on earth, our job is to proclaim. So again, assets, strong biblical foundation. You know, we hear over and over again in the New Testament. That great commission to go and preach the gospel to all nations. There's a clear identity and mission for the church. We are here to spread the gospel. 
There's a focus on God's sovereignty and transcendence. You know, God isn't here preaching. We are. God is removed. Our job is to be God's mouthpiece. And a rich theology of Scripture and God's Word. On the other hand, it can neglect the incarnational aspects of divine revelation. It tends to see God as removed from the earth, not present here with us. It can also neglect the institutional dimension. You know, my job is just to be out there proclaiming the word. You know, I don't need to attend to a lot of the institutional organizational type of stuff. It can tend towards a lack of a proper understanding of the role of the magisterium. That's the teaching authority of the church. You know, part of the work of the magisterium is to evaluate the preaching that people do. So if you're too focused on preaching, you can just be out there saying willy-nilly. And can sometimes risk neglecting the works of mercy by saying, I proclaim the gospel to you, that's all I'm supposed to do, good luck with the rest of your life. So there'd be a tendency towards that. But again, a strong sense of mission and deeply biblically rooted. The fifth model is the church's servant. This is one that's becoming increasingly popular nowadays. This sees the church as part of the world and seeks to build bridges with the world. So it's not the church against the world, but it's the church entering into the world from an aspect of service. It engages in secular dialogue with the rest of the world. How can we work together with other non-Christian organizations? This is a model I think Pope Francis works out of a lot. Pope Francis talks a lot about the need for the church to be a field hospital, to go out into the world and heal the wounded. You know, that's very classic church as servant model. And it's embodied in Catholic social services, Catholic schools, Catholic health care. The church has a rich history of being in the world doing the works of mercy, you know, motivated by our faith. So assets, it's attuned to modernity. Like I said, this is a very popular, modern kind of way of thinking about the church. There's lots of support for witness of the faith in the world through this model. You know, we go and we set up Catholic schools in order to educate the poor. We set up Catholic hospitals in order to care for those who don't have the means to care for themselves. Things like that. On the other hand, there's indirect support from sacred scripture for this one. It's clear the church is to be doing works in the world and helping people, but it's not not as explicit as, say, the herald model in Scripture. There can be an ambiguity about the meaning of service. And what exactly does that mean? What does it mean to be a Christian doing service in the world? Sometimes that service doesn't lead to a direct proclamation of the gospel. And there's a risk that the church just becomes another non-governmental organization doing good works in the world. But it's, it becomes hard to see the direct connection between the faith of the church and why we're doing those works. We're not going out and doing those works just because it's a nice thing to do. I mean, it is a nice thing to do. But we're motivated to do it because we're disciples of Jesus Christ. Because we're called to extend God's mercy through all the world. And part of that we do through works of service. So when Cardinal Dulles originally wrote his book, those were the five models he proposed. About ten years later, he updated the book and added a sixth. And his protestations to the side, even though he says none of these models is kind of the model, I think this is the model he really liked. <laughs> when you read the book, it becomes clear that this, this was kind of the fruit of his thinking about how do I take the best out of all these five models and combine them into something that's really kind of going to hit more of the mark about what the church is. And this he called the church as a community of disciples. So this is rooted in Jesus' public ministry. Jesus, when he was on earth, gathered people around him to whom he could impart his teaching. The twelve apostles, yes, but actually there's a wide group of disciples that surrounded Jesus. We tend to focus on the twelve. When you read the scriptures, it's clear there's lots of people who are orbiting around Jesus, coming and going, listening to his teaching, learning from him. And this community contained gradations of discipleship. So the twelve were the closest, there were some others that were kind of outside that, there's lots of others who were a little more outside that. And the closer you became, the closer you were to a follower of Jesus, knowing him more intimately. So for instance, when Jesus would teach in parables, 
It would say the crowds often did not understand the parables, but Jesus would then later explain it to the twelve. They got special teaching. They got a little bit more because they were closer to Jesus. So this community of disciples model is rooted in scripture. It offers a path of renewal for the church. Because again, it recognizes we're not perfect. We can always come closer to Jesus. It motivates us to further conversion and imitation of Jesus. And offers initiation into a community of faith in our secular, constantly changing world. Again, going back to thinking about that mystical communion, everyone wants to belong. So having a community to belong to can be very important. On the other hand, it can accentuate the way that Christians are removed from the world. Part of the, part of the thing about the community of disciples model is it starts to, we're disciples and you're not. So then you kind of separate it out from everyone else. It can seem excessively demanding. You know, again, when you read in the scriptures about what Jesus demands of his disciples, it can be kind of a high standard. And it implies that the church is just a free association of those who wish to join, as opposed to a communion of persons dedicated to their faith to Christ. So again, no one of these models is correct, but all of them give us a better glimpse of the truth of what the church is and how we understand the church as Catholics. With that, I think it's about time for a break. Uh, so let's take five minutes. Sure, five minutes. You want to chat during the break? I'll be up here. So, yeah, five minutes. Great. <laughs> All right. We got two more sections to get through, and I'm hoping I can do it in the next 32 minutes. I don't keep you, there, but we'll see. Uh, there's a very interesting question that sometimes arises when we think about the church. I'm giving you a second just to kind of ponder this. What is the difference between the Catholic Church? and the Roman Catholic Church. What is the difference between the Catholic Church and the Roman Catholic Church? This is a question we as Americans don't have to ponder too much, because most every Catholic in America is a Roman Catholic. But the Roman Catholic Church is just one of 24 churches that makes up the Catholic Church. Again, we in America don't see that so much because uh, what are called the Eastern Catholic churches aren't all that well represented in America. But if you were to be in Europe, and especially Eastern Europe, a lot of the Catholics you would meet there would not be Roman Catholics. They would be members of one of other of 23 other Catholic churches. Now these are separate churches. They have their own liturgy. They have their own church law. But they are in communion with the Pope, and so are members of the Catholic Church. Uh, the picture up there, this is an example of a, a bishop from the Greek Ukrainian Catholic Church. So you see the vestments are very different from what we'd see in a bishop uh, in the Roman Catholic Church. Even his mitre looks very, very different. It's more like a crown. Uh, these are, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but I feel like I have to mention it just because it is something not a lot of people know about. And it's a fascinating part of the Catholic Church. And it helps us to recognize the great diversity within the Catholic Church. So most, a lot of these churches are rooted in some of the ancient patriarchies of the early church. These are important cities that were major centers of Christianity in the ancient world. And traditionally, there were five of them. Rome, Antioch, Alexandria, Constantinople, and Jerusalem. Now remember, just a quick little piece of history. So in the early days of the church, we didn't have a book that told us how to say the Mass. You know, for the first you know, many centuries of the church, we didn't have those kinds of books. Every local church had their own way of doing the liturgy. It wasn't unified. It wasn't really until around the 1500s that the church started to unify the way the liturgy was said across the world. But at the same time, the church also said, if you have something that's 200 years older than what you're doing now, we're going to let you keep it. And so there is still a diversity of liturgies within the church. Part of this, though, is also based on these ancient churches. These are places that have their own way of being church, their own way of doing liturgy. As valid as what we do in the Roman Catholic Church, 
but often based on language. So in the Roman Catholic Church, our liturgical language is Latin. That means all of our liturgical books, you know, the book that the priest uses to say Mass, that is originally written, written in Latin and then is translated into English and Spanish and German and all the other languages. These churches use a different liturgical language. It might be Greek, it might be Lebanese, uh, it might be Egyptian or ancient Coptic, but they have a much more ancient tradition in the way they do the liturgy. Now, a lot of these churches were kind of autonomous, uh, but still connected to Rome until the Great Schism in 1054. This is when the Eastern Orthodox churches separated from the Roman Catholic Church. They separated from Rome uh, for various theological and really even political reasons. We won't go into that history. But as those kind of empires fell apart and politically it became hard for local churches to keep connected to their bishop, some of these churches chose to come back to Rome while still retaining their own traditions, their own liturgies, and everything like that. And so these are the, the Eastern Catholic churches. The six largest are the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, the Syro Malabar Church, the Maronite Church, which is universally recognized as the only one of the Eastern churches that never separated with Rome. They didn't have to come back because they never left. The Melkite Catholic Church, which actually used to consider itself in communion with both the West and the East until it itself split into. Uh, the Chaldean Catholic Church and the Armenian Catholic Church. Now again, you're not going to find a lot of these in America, but they are around. Uh, the, Maronite, the Maronite Church in America has a cathedral in St. Louis. So St. Louis has a Roman Catholic cathedral, but also has a Maronite Catholic cathedral. And if you go there, the liturgy is going to look very different. They'll even use some Lebanese in their liturgy. It'll be a little different. If you ever get an opportunity, once we're past you know, this global pandemic and everything, and it's safer to travel around and stuff, go down to Indianapolis on a Sunday and go to Mass at St. Athanasius Church. It's a, I believe it's Greek Ukrainian Catholic Church. But it's going to be a very different type of liturgy. You know, you'll recognize a lot of the same parts of the Mass. They're going to read from Scripture, there'll be a homily. But, you know, the, the way they pray the Eucharist will be a little bit different. But it's still a valid Eucharist that fulfills your Sunday obligation. They're still in communion with Rome. It's just a different way of being Catholic. One of the, I will just say, from personal experience, one of the weirdest things about going to an Eastern Catholic church is uh, they, use, they use leavened bread for the Eucharist instead of unleavened bread. So when you receive the Eucharist, it just it, it feels different in your mouth. That's one of the weirdest things. The other, I should also warn you, the other one is the way they distribute the Eucharist is they actually put it on a spoon and put it into your mouth. And they're very skilled. They don't touch your mouth or anything, but they use a spoon to distribute the Eucharist. It's very interesting. We can tell you some more details. If you want to talk to me after we're done here, but I gotta keep going. <laughs> so these churches are autonomous churches. That means they're separate from the Roman Catholic Church. They are authentic churches. They have valid apostolic succession, valid Eucharist and they are in communion with Rome. They have their own liturgies, their own liturgical calendars. They have a separate body of church law. The Roman Catholic Church is governed by what's called the Code of Canon Law. The Eastern Catholic Churches have their own Code of Canon Law for the Eastern Churches. So they have their own separate laws. They don't have their own Pope. And that's an important distinction. The Pope is the Pope of the entire Catholic Church. You know, the reason that these Eastern Catholic Churches are part of the Catholic Church is because they are in communion with the Pope. They recognize the authority of the Pope. But they do have their own leaders that are called patriarchs. They're kind of the equivalent of like a super archbishop. Uh, they're actually elected by the bishops of their church. And the Pope doesn't have to like confirm the election or anything. But he does just, after they're elected, confirm that yes, I recognize you and you are in communion. The goal of the Eastern Catholic Churches is one day to be reunited with their equivalent church in the Eastern Orthodox Churches. And that's very interesting. I, I had the opportunity once to talk with a, a priest from one of the Eastern Catholic Churches, and he was very clear. Our goal is to one day be reunited with them so that we're no longer separate. We'll just be folded back in when the Eastern Orthodox hopefully one day come back in, recognize the Pope. We will just go and rejoin our Eastern Orthodox brothers and sisters. Because they still have the same liturgy, they have the same traditions. 
The only difference is they have decided to come back into communion with Rome, whereas the Eastern Orthodox have not. So the great prayer of the Eastern Catholic Churches is for that reuniting with our separated brothers and sisters in the Eastern Orthodox Churches. You know, for the, uh, the healing of that wound between East and West. Which is a beautiful prayer. It's something we should all pray for. Alright, and finally I want to end by kind of talking about the hierarchy of the church. And this is, this is going to be much more nuts and bolts. <laughs> Thinking about the church. Uh, so when people think of Catholic hierarchy, they will often almost immediately think about the Vatican. You know, we hear a lot about the Vatican says, or the Vatican released a document that says, you know, or something happened at the Vatican. Uh, but what the Vatican is, is actually a lot more complicated than we sometimes give it credit for. I'm actually going to show a short video. Uh, this is by a YouTuber named CGP Gray. He's one of my favorite YouTubers. He does short little educational videos. He actually has a nice little video on the Vatican and what exactly the Vatican is. Uh, like I said, it's, it's a little more complicated than we sometimes give it credit for. So it, it's just kind of a funny way to say that the Catholic Church is really kind of a unique institution in the sense that it is both a country, it is a church, it is a corporation, it's all of these things in one. Uh, I often said, you know, I've spent I spent basically my entire adult life working for the church. Uh, and I, I will often tell people, there's no good way to explain what the church is. It's not like any other institution. It has kind of aspects of other institutions, but it's not one-to-one. -one. So the church isn't like the military, even though there's parts of the church that are kind of, you know, act like that kind of a hierarchy. It's not like a business, even though we try to use good business practices and things like that. Uh, the church is really kind of its own, own entity in a lot of ways. Uh, the best way I, exp I can explain it, though, is to remember that many of these institutions of the church solidified in the medieval age, in the Middle Ages. So in many ways, the best way to think about it is that the church is a very medieval kind of a hierarchy. You know, we mentioned that you know, the Pope is an absolute monarch. You know, one of the few remaining absolute monarchies in, in the world. You know, the church has absolute power over the Vatican. You know, we just don't, we don't have those anymore. And especially for those of us who have grown up in democracies, you know, we understand how that works. But the idea of having someone having authority just because they have a certain role, you know, that's very, very foreign for us. But that's the way the church operates. You know, the Pope has authority because he's the Bishop of Rome. And for no other reason. It doesn't matter if the Pope's a good person. It doesn't matter if the, bad, the Pope is a bad person. And in case you haven't read your church history, we've had a lot of bad Popes. I mean, really bad popes. You know, there's a reason, you know, the vast majority of popes have not been named saints. <laughs> uh, but that doesn't matter in terms of their authority. You know? Uh, so here's kind of how the, the church lays out that authority and how that authority kind of goes down. So at the top uh, of the universal church, you have the pope. He is the head of the universal church because he sits in the holy see. Uh, and that is a real chair in St. John's Lateran in Rome. It's not in St. Peter's. Uh, that's a, just an interesting little thing. A lot of people think that St. Peter's Basilica is the, the Pope's cathedral. The Basilica of St. Peter's is not a cathedral. The Pope's cathedral is the Lateran, St. John's Lateran in Rome. That is the Pope's cathedral. And his cathedra, which is Latin for chair, is in that cathedral. Every cathedral is a cathedral because it has a cathedra, the bishop's chair in it. So because the Pope sits in the Holy See, he is the Pope. He is helped by a few different organizations. First of all, the Roman Curia, which is just a fancy word for saying all the different offices at the Vatican that help the Pope. All the different congregations, the tribunals, the councils, the commissions that the Pope sets up to help him handle different aspects of the Church's life, all of those assist the Pope in Rome. Uh, here's a few just notable ones you'll often sometimes hear. So, the congregation, that label congregation, kind of stands for the, one of the highest levels in terms of offices at the Vatican. Uh, so the Congregation for Divine Worship and the Discipline of the Sacraments, that's the organization, the office, that helps the Pope when it comes to determining questions about the sacraments and how we celebrate the liturgy together. So any Catholic can write a letter to that congregation and say, hey, if we did this in the liturgy, is that a good thing or a bad thing? 
And they will respond and say either, yes, that was fine, or no, that shouldn't have happened. You know, those, and those are called dubias. You ask a question like that, it's called a dubia. I doubt whether something was right or wrong. You need to clarify why. You know, and so you'll often hear about dubia coming out of that congregation as an answer to a question that some bishop or a priest or someone had about how the sacraments and divine worship is supposed to work. The Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith does the same thing, for, but for doctrinal questions. If you have a question about theology, you can write to them, and they'll give you a response. You know, they will, that's also the organization that if there's a theologian who they think might be writing something a little wonky, they will sometimes be referred to that congregation. They'll review the writings and say whether or not those writings are good or not. Incidentally, historically speaking, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith is actually kind of the modern version of the Inquisition. The, the, the office of the Inquisition got morphed into the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Uh, obviously not doing the same kind of things, but historically that's how it works. Uh, the Congregation for Bishops is the organization that helps the Pope decide who will be named bishops around the world. And the Congregation for the Causes of Saints is the congregation that looks into the lives of potential saints and then makes recommendations to the Pope about who should go on forward in their cause for canonization or not. So the Pope has all these offices that help them do all these different things. Besides the Roman Curia, the Pope is also assisted by the College of Cardinals. So a cardinal is not an extra layer within the church hierarchy. Uh, cardinals are just people who have been given a special title and a special role to be advisors to the Pope. The main role of the cardinals is, first, to advise the Pope, so we can call what are called consistories, when all the cardinals will come together and they'll have meetings with the Pope and discuss questions that the Pope has that he wants some advice on. The cardinals are also then the group, of course, that actually elects the Pope. So when a Pope dies or resigns, the cardinals gather together in Rome, and they have a whole process, uh, or they go through in terms of electing the next Pope. Uh, incidentally, CGP Gray has a really good video on how Popes are elected, so if you want to, you can look that up afterwards too. Uh, so that's their role. So the Pope, the Universal Church, has these helpers, the Roman Curia, and the College of Cardinals. The next level down from the Pope are the bishops. A bishop is named to oversee a diocese. And a diocese is just a geographic portion of the church. Some dioceses are very large. Uh, the state of Utah is one diocese, the Diocese of Salt Lake City. As you can imagine, that bishop travels a lot. Uh, some dioceses are very small. The Archdiocese of Chicago, I think, is two counties, you know, but has a much larger population. You know, so the archbishop uh, in Chicago doesn't have to drive quite as many distances, but he travels a lot more places. He has a lot more churches packed in a much smaller area. But a bishop oversees a diocese. Again, like I mentioned, every bishop has their own cathedra that sits in their cathedral. So if you go over to our cathedral, the big chair that sits in the back, that's the bishop's chair. No one else sits there. That's the bishop's chair. It is the symbol of his authority. And this goes back to Roman times, when if you were a king or something like that, when you sat in your throne, that was the symbol of your authority. When you sit at the throne, you are speaking with authority. It's the same thing in the church. You know, that's when we call the Pope speaking ex cathedra, that means he's speaking from the chair, which means he's giving the highest kind of teaching that he can. Bishops can do the same thing. They have a very similar kind of authority in terms of teaching. In fact, we see that bishops have the fullness of Christ's ministry. We say that Christ had three different ministries, priest, prophet, and king. And in the Catholic Church, it is the bishops who received the fullness of that ministry as priest, prophet, and king. That means as priests, they pray, they celebrate the sacraments, you know, that's the sanctification, that's how they pray for holiness and make things holy. Prophet is their teaching ministry and how they proclaim the word. And the kingly ministry is just about organization and authority and being able to kind of make decisions. Uh, incidentally, all three of those ministries are rooted in the Old Testament. We find the prototypes for all of those in the Old Testament, in terms of priest, prophet, and king. Prophet, obviously the Old Testament prophets, especially Elijah. Uh, teachers, there's lots of different, uh, uh, 
priest, you know, we see the high priest, the importance of the high priest in the Old Testament, and king, especially David and Solomon, is kind of the pinnacle of the Old Testament kingships. All those find their fulfillment in Jesus Christ, who then pass those ministries on to the apostles and the bishops. So that's why bishops have that authority, it's because they have the fullness of Christ's ministry. Bishops are also assisted by various people. First of all, every bishop has a vicar general. Vicar is just a fancy word of someone who can act with the same authority as. So if someone is a vicar, it means they stand vicariously for that other person. So the vicar general has almost all the same authority that the bishop does. When the vicar general speaks, it's as if the bishop speaks. So the vicar general is one of the closest assistants to the bishop, because the bishop has invested a lot of his authority into that vicar general. The second most important one in a diocese is the chancellor. The chancellor's job is to maintain all the records. Canon law says there's only two positions you have to have besides a bishop in a diocese, the vicar general and the chancellor. Everything else is perfect. You can have a diocese with just a bishop, the vicar general, and the chancellor. And the vicar general and the chancellor could be the same person. And a lot of dioceses actually do that. The vicar general is also the chancellor. Incidentally, the chancellor is the only person who keeps their job when a bishop moves or dies. Because part of the importance when we're between bishops is the maintaining of the records. You're making sure that the records are maintained and no one comes in and messes with them and things like that. Yeah? The, the general and the chancellor, do they have to be priests or just a lay person? The vicar general must be a priest. The chancellor can be a lay person. And nowadays, a lot of dioceses, the chancellor will be a lay person. And increasingly, a lot of women, too. The first chancellor I worked for in my diocese in, uh, in Illinois was a woman. Really wonderful one. Yeah. So Vicar General and Chancellor, very important. Again, so important, they're dictated by canon law, church law, that they have to be there. Uh, the College of Consultors is a group of priests who act as close advisors to the bishop. He can call them whenever he wants and ask for their opinions on things. Uh, kind of analogous with the College of Cardinals in some ways. Uh, also because their role when a bishop is moved or passes away, their job is to elect the diocesan administrator. They have to elect a priest in the diocese who's going to help administer the diocese while you're between bishops. And the College of Consultors are the ones that elect that person, just like the College of Cardinals elects the next pope. The Presbyteral Council is a group of priests who act as kind of advocates for the priests of the diocese to the bishop. So they also they advise the bishop, but their job is also to kind of be the representatives for the priests to the bishop. You know, in a lot of places, the Presbyteral Council will meet on a monthly basis with the bishop, and they'll bring, you know, here's important questions or issues that our priests are dealing with, things that are happening in the parishes that the bishop should be aware of and if he needs to answer questions about. And then every diocese also have its own curia, or we call it just the diocesan offices. You know, so I work within our diocese of Curia in the office of catechesis. We also have an office of worship. We have a tribunal, which is like our diocese in court, essentially. Um, you know, we have a Catholic school's office. You know, just lots of different offices that are here to help do the business of the diocese. You know, the administrative office that pays the bills, an HR office that helps with those things. You know, nowadays, modern dioceses are pretty, pretty savvy when it comes to a lot of that kind of stuff, as we've had here. So, Pope at the Universal Church, Bishop at the Diocese, and then the Pastor oversees a parish. Yeah? Okay, Arch. When you add Archdiocese or Archbishop, how does that fall into? Great question. So this is where people sometimes think that the Bishop answers to the Archbishop. That's not how it works. Every Bishop answers directly to the Pope. There is no in-between between a bishop and the pope. An archbishop is an archbishop because he's named to an archdiocese, which just means that that's the, the diocese that's kind of the head diocese within what's called a province. So within the church, we have, you know, when you get kind of to the national level within the United States, we also have a number of different provinces, which are just groups of dioceses. Oftentimes by state, so when I was in Illinois, we were in the province of Chicago, and that just encompassed all of Illinois. Same thing in Indiana. We live in the province of Indianapolis, which just includes all the dioceses in Indiana, which is Gary, Fort Wayne, South Bend, 
Lafayette, Indiana, Indianapolis, and Evansville. So those five dioceses make up the province of Indianapolis. The Archdiocese of Indianapolis is kind of the premier diocese within the province. And the role of the Archbishop is just kind of act as the first among equals of the bishop within the province. So the Archdiocese of Indianapolis cannot tell our bishop what to do. He doesn't have that kind of authority over our bishop. But his job is to be kind of a collaborator with the other bishops within the province. He gathers them together a couple times a year so they can talk about what's going on in their diocese. As you can imagine, this year they've been meeting very, very regularly to discuss how are we addressing the global pandemic, those kinds of things. You know, it's his job to kind of be the chair of those kinds of meetings. Uh, but again, he doesn't have the ability to tell Bishop Doherty what to do. Now, Bishop Doherty is a smart guy. He's got to listen to the Archbishop. <laughs> you know, they're not antagonistic or anything like that. But, you know, just by church law, an Archbishop does not have that kind of authority. Similarly speaking, uh, I'll mention this too because this often comes up. We also talk about Episcopal conferences. So you'll sometimes hear about the USCCB, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, which is all the bishops in the United States. They don't have the authority to tell a bishop what to do. You know, again, it's a consultative group. It's the bishops coming together to discuss common issues across our country. You know, and sometimes teaching together on certain subjects. But it's not an authoritative body. The Episcopal Conference, the USCCB, has a certain few things that canon law gives them authority over. The biggest one being when those liturgical books are being taken from Latin and translated into English, the bishops sign off on it. You know, they get a chance to kind of look over, give advice back to Rome. You know, we don't really like the way this was translated. Can you tweak this or do that? You know, but they're not, again, an authoritative body. They don't oversee dioceses. They don't oversee bishops. So bishops answer to the Pope. Yeah. What do you mean by a regional council? Like, as opposed to an ecumenical council, or a regional council? Oh, um, regional councils don't have the ability to teach binding doctrine like an ecumenical council does. You know, they can, they can teach kind of a, here's what we as local bishops say, but it's, it's not binding on anyone outside of that region. You know, an ecumenical council is really kind of the highest teaching authority within the church when all the bishops of the world come together. To talk about things, yeah. So it, it's more consultative, it's more pastoral kind of teaching than doctrine. So then finally, a pastor is, over, is given authority over a parish, which again is another geographic subdivision within a diocese. A pastor is always a priest, and they share in the ministry of the bishop. So a priest, when the bishop lays hands on the priest, the bishop is sharing his threefold ministry of priest, prophet, and king with that priest. So that the priest is a helper of the bishop. Pastors will often be helped by parochial vicars, that's other priests who aren't the pastor but are assigned to a, a parish to assist the pastor. Deacons also help out at the parish level, but deacons, theologically speaking, really are helpers of the bishop. You know, they're not underneath the priest, they're really kind of parallel with the priest. They don't have the same kind of authority, they don't have the same kind of ministry, but a deacon is a deacon because he's been invested with ministry by the bishop, just like a priest. It's just a different type of ministry. So the church really talks about deacons as helpers of the bishop. They are answerable to the bishop. Now again, they're usually assigned to a parish. They cooperate with their pastor. They listen to their pastor. Uh, but theologically speaking, they, they answer to the bishop. Pastors will often erect councils, committees, different offices. They'll hire staff to help them with things, just like the pope, just like a bishop. And canonically speaking, they're required to have a finance council. Every parish has to have a finance council who is there to assist the, the pastor making sure that the parish is well cared for, that the finances are being taken care of. Yeah. Uh, you'd be surprised. It's only... I did my graduate work uh, with the Dominican orders in St. Louis at their school of theology there. And this was... I started there in 2000, and it was still considered novel at that time that that seminary required all their priest students to take a one semester business class. <laughs> Which is why priests, you know, rightly so, look for good advice from lay people who know about business, know about finances. You know, it's why we have finance councils, things like that. So that's just a very simplified way of thinking about the hierarchy of the church. You know, the Pope, a 
oversees the universal church. He appoints bishops, invests in them. The fullness of Christ's ministry is priest, prophet, and king. Bishops, in turn, share that ministry with their priests and with their deacons, who are then there here at the local level to shepherd us. And that's where I want to leave you with, is the purpose of all this hierarchy, the purpose of all this authority, is to be of service to the church. It's not authority to wield power. It's not authority to make themselves feel good. It's to be of service to us as lay people, to support us, to give us the graces of the sacraments, to forgive our sins, so that we can go out into the world and proclaim Christ to the people that we meet. The purpose of the hierarchy, the purpose of the church, is to spread the gospel in all the world. It's for the purpose of evangelization. So when all this is working correctly, when all this is working the right way, we should feel supported and cared for, that we are growing spiritually, that we are growing in holiness, so that through the graces we're receiving, we can then go out into the world and be Christ to other people. That's the mission of the church. That's what those of us who are baptized into the life of Christ, who are baptized into the church, that's what we are called to do, is to go out, do the works of mercy, to be the hands and feet of